an Attic Philosopher, entire by Emil Sylvester, Part 3 out of 3. Roofs and with a low, rushing sound ran along the gurgling gutters, sometimes a gust of wind forced itself beneath the tiles, which rattled together like castanets, and afterward it was lost in the empty corridor. And a slight and pleasurable shiver thrilled through my veins. I drew the flaps of my old wadded dressing gown around me. I pulled my threadbare velvet cap over my eyes, and letting myself sink deeper into my easy chair, while my feet basked in the heat and light which shone through the door of the stove. I gave myself up to a sensation of enjoyment, made more lively by the consciousness of the storm which raged without. My eyes, swimming in a sort of mist, wandered over all the details of my peaceful abode. They passed from my prints to my bookcase, resting upon the little chintz sofa, the white curtains of the iron bedstead, and the portfolio of loose papers those archives of the attics, and then, returning to the book I held in my hand, they attempted to seize once more the thread of the reading which had been thus interrupted. In fact, this book, the subject of which had at first interested me, had become painful to me. I had come to the conclusion that the pictures of the writer were too somber. His description of the miseries of the world appeared exaggerated to me, I could not believe in such excess of poverty and of suffering. Neither God nor man could show themselves so harsh toward the sons of Adam. The author had yielded to an artistic temptation. He was making a show of the sufferings of humanity, as Nero burned Rome for the sake of the picturesque. Taken altogether, this poor human house, so often repaired, so much criticized, is still a pretty good abode. We may find enough in it to satisfy our wants, if we know how to set bounds to them. The happiness of the wise man costs but little, and asks but little space. These consoling reflections became more and more confused. At last my book fell on the ground without my having the resolution to stoop and take it up again. And insensibly overcome by the luxury of the silence, the subdued light, and the warmth, I fell asleep. I remained for some time lost in the sort of insensibility belonging to a first sleep. At last some vague and broken sensations came over me, it seemed to me that the day grew darker, that the air became colder. I half perceived bushes covered with the scarlet berries which foretell the coming of winter. I walked on a dreary road, bordered here and there with juniper trees white with frost. Then the scene suddenly changed. I was in the diligence. The cold wind shook the doors and windows. The trees loaded with snow, passed by light ghosts. In vain I thrust my benumbed feet into the crushed straw. At last the carriage stopped, and, by one of those stage effects so common in sleep, I found myself alone in a barn. Without a fireplace, and open to the winds on all sides. I saw again my mother's gentle face, known only to me in my early childhood, the noble and stern countenance of my father, the little fair head of my sister, who was taken from us at ten years old. All my dead family lived again around me. They were there, exposed to the bitings of the cold, and to the pangs of hunger. 
my mother prayed by the resigned old man, and my sister rolled up on some rags of which they had made her a bed, wept in silence, and held her naked feet in her little blue hands. It was a page from the book I had just read transferred into my own existence. My heart was oppressed with inexpressible anguish, crouched in a corner, with my eyes fixed upon this dismal picture. I felt the cold slowly creeping upon me, and I said to myself with bitterness, Let us die, since poverty is a dungeon guarded by suspicion, apathy and contempt, and from which it is vain to try to escape. Let us die, since there is no place for us at the banquet of the living. And I tried to rise to join my mother again, and to wait at her feet for the hour of release. This effort dispelled my dream, and I awoke with a start. I looked around me, my lamp was expiring, the fire in my stove extinguished, and my half-opened door was letting in an icy wind. I got up with a shiver to shut and double-lock it, then I made for the alcove and went to bed in haste. The cold kept me awake a long time, and my thoughts continued the interrupted dream. The pictures I had lately accused of exaggeration now seemed but a too faithful representation of reality. And I went to sleep without being able to recover my optimism or my warmth. Thus did a cold stove and a badly closed door alter my point of view. All went well when my blood circulated properly, all looked gloomy when the cold laid hold on me. This reminds me of the story of the Duchess who was obliged to pay a visit to the neighboring convent on a winter's day. The convent was poor, there was no wood, and the monks had nothing but their discipline and the ardor of their prayers to keep out the cold. The Duchess, who was shivering with cold, returned home, greatly pitying the poor monks. While the servants were taking off her cloak and adding two more logs to her fire, she called her steward, whom she ordered to send some wood to the convent immediately. She then had her couch moved close to the fireside, the warmth of which soon revived her. The recollection of what she had just suffered was speedily lost in her present comfort when the steward came in again to ask how many loads of wood he was to send. Oh, you may wait, said the great lady carelessly. The weather is very much milder. Thus man's judgments are formed less from reason than from sensation, and as sensation comes to him from the outward world, so he finds himself more or less under its influence, by little and little he imbibes a portion of his habits and feelings from it. It is not, then, without cause that, when we wish to judge of a stranger beforehand, we look for indications of his character in the circumstances which surround him. The things among which we live are necessarily made to take our image, and we unconsciously leave in them a thousand impressions of our minds. As we can judge by an empty bed of the height and attitude of him who has slept in it, so the abode of every man discovers to a close observer the extent of his intelligence and the feelings of his heart. Bernardin de Saint-Pierre has related the story of a young girl who refused a suitor because he would never have flowers or domestic animals in his house. Perhaps the sentence was severe, but not without reason. We may presume that a man insensible to beauty and to humble affection must be ill-prepared to feel the enjoyments of a happy marriage. 
14th, 7 o'clock p.m. this morning, as I was opening my journal to write, I had a visit from our old cashier. His sight is not so good as it was, his hand begins to shake, and the work he was able to do formerly is now becoming somewhat laborious to him. I had undertaken to write out some of his papers, and he came for those I had finished. We conversed a long time by the stove, while he was drinking a cup of coffee which I made him take. M. Rathau is a sensible man, who has observed much and speaks little, so that he has always something to say. While looking over the accounts I had prepared for him, his look fell upon my journal, and I was obliged to acknowledge that in this way I wrote a diary of my actions and thoughts every evening for private use. From one thing to another, I began speaking to him of my dream the day before, and my reflections about the influence of outward objects upon our ordinary sentiments. He smiled. Ah, you too have my superstitions, he said quietly. I have always believed, like you, that you may know the game by the lair. It is only necessary to have tact and experience. But without them we commit ourselves to many rash judgments. For my part, I have been guilty of this more than once, but sometimes I have also drawn a right conclusion. I recollect especially an adventure which goes as far back as the first years of my youth. He stopped. I looked at him as if I waited for his story, and he told it me at once. At this time, he was still but third clerk to an attorney at Orleans. His master had sent him to Montargis on different affairs, and he intended to return in the diligence the same evening. After having received the amount of a bill at a neighboring town, but they kept him at the debtor's house. And when he was able to set out the day had already closed. Fearing not to be able to reach Montargis in good time, he took a crossroad, they pointed out to him. Unfortunately the fog increased, no star was visible in the heavens, and the darkness became so great that he lost his road. He tried to retrace his steps, past twenty footpaths, and at last was completely astray. After the vexation of losing his place in the diligence came the feeling of uneasiness as to his situation. He was alone, on foot, lost in a forest, without any means of finding his right road again, and with a considerable sum of money about him, for which he was responsible. His anxiety was increased by his inexperience. The idea of a forest was connected in his mind with so many adventures of robbery and murder, that he expected some fatal encounter every instant. To say the truth, his situation was not encouraging. The place was not considered safe, and for some time past there had been rumors of the sudden disappearance of several horse dealers. Though there was no trace of any crime having been committed. Our young traveler, with his eyes staring forward, and his ears listening, followed a footpath which he supposed might take him to some house or road. But woods always succeeded to woods. At last he perceived a light at a distance, and in a quarter of an hour he reached the high road. A single house, the light from which had attracted him, appeared at a little distance. He was going toward the entrance gate of the courtyard when the trot of a horse made him turn his head. 
a man on horseback had just appeared at the turning of the road, and in an instant was close to him. The first words he addressed to the young man showed him to be the farmer himself. He related how he had lost himself, and learned from the countryman that he was on the road to Pithiviers. Montargis was three leagues behind him. The fog had insensibly changed into a drizzling rain, which was beginning to wet the young clerk through. He seemed afraid of the distance he had still to go, and the horseman, who saw his hesitation, invited him to come into the farmhouse. It had something of the look of a fortress, surrounded by a pretty high wall. It could not be seen except through the bars of the great gate, which was carefully closed. The farmer, who had got off his horse, did not go near it, but, turning to the right, reached another entrance closed in the same way, but of which he had the key. Hardly had he passed the threshold when a terrible barking resounded from each end of the yard. The farmer told his guest to fear nothing, and showed him the dogs chained up to their kennels. Both were of an extraordinary size, and so savage that the sight of their master himself could not quiet them. A boy, attracted by their barking, came out of the house and took the farmer's horse. The latter began questioning him about some orders he had given before he left the house, and went toward the stable to see that they had been executed. Thus left alone, our clerk looked about him. A lantern which the boy had placed on the ground cast a dim light over the courtyard. All around seemed empty and deserted. Not a trace was visible of the disorder often seen in a country farmyard, and which shows a temporary cessation of the work, which is soon to be resumed again. Neither a cart forgotten where the horses had been unharnessed, nor sheaves of corn heaped up ready for threshing, nor a plough overturned in a corner and half hidden under the freshly cut clover. The yard was swept, the barns shut up and padlocked, not a single vine creeping up the walls, everywhere stone, wood, and iron. He took up the lantern and went up to the corner of the house. Behind was a second yard, where he heard the barking of a third dog, and a covered wall was built in the middle of it. Our traveller looked in vain for the little farm garden where pumpkins of different sorts creep along the ground, or where the bees from the hives hum under the hedges of honeysuckle and elder. Verdure and flowers were nowhere to be seen. He did not even perceive the sight of a poultry yard or pigeon house. The habitation of his host was everywhere wanting in that which makes the grace and the life of the country. The young man thought that his host must be of a very careless or a very calculating disposition to concede so little to domestic enjoyments and the pleasures of the eye. And judging, in spite of himself, by what he saw, he could not help feeling a distrust of his character. In the meantime, the farmer returned from the stables and made him enter the house. The inside of the farmhouse corresponded to its outside. The whitewashed walls had no other ornament than a row of guns of all sizes. The massive furniture hardly redeemed its clumsy appearance by its great solidity. The cleanliness was doubtful, and the absence of all minor conveniences proved that a woman's care was wanting in the household concerns, the young clerk learned that the farmer, in fact, 
lived here with no one but his two sons. Of this, indeed, the signs were plain enough, a table with the cloth laid, that no one had taken the trouble to clear away. It was left near the window. The plates and dishes were scattered upon it without any order, and loaded with potato parings and half-picked bones. Several empty bottles emitted an odor of brandy, mixed with the pungent smell of tobacco smoke. After seating his guest, the farmer lighted his pipe, and his two sons resumed their work by the fireside. Now and then, the silence was just broken by a short remark, answered by a word or an exclamation. And then all became as mute as before. From my childhood, said the old cashier, I had been very sensible to the impression of outward objects. Later in life, reflection had taught me to study the causes of these impressions rather than to drive them away. I set myself, then, to examine everything around me with great attention. Below the guns, I had remarked on entering, some wolf traps were suspended, and to one of them still hung the mangled remains of a wolf's paw, which they had not yet taken off from the iron teeth. The blackened chimney-piece was ornamented by an owl and a raven nailed on the wall, their wings extended, and their throats with a huge nail through each. A fox skin freshly flayed was spread before the window, and a larder hook fixed into the principal beam held a headless goose, whose body swayed about over our heads. My eyes were offended by all these details, and I turned them again upon my hosts. The father, who sat opposite to me, only interrupted his smoking to pour out his drink, or addressed some reprimand to his sons. The eldest of these was scraping a deep bucket, and the bloody scrapings, which he threw into the fire every instant, filled the room with a disagreeable fetid smell, the second son was sharpening some butcher's knives. I learned from a word dropped from the father that they were preparing to kill a pig the next day. These occupations, and the whole aspect of things inside the house told of such habitual coarseness in their way of living as seemed to explain. While it formed the fitting counterpart of the forbidding gloominess of the outside, my astonishment by degrees changed into disgust, and my disgust into uneasiness. I cannot detail the whole chain of ideas which succeeded one another in my imagination. But, yielding to an impulse I could not overcome, I got up, declaring I would go on my road again. The farmer made some effort to keep me, he spoke of the rain, of the darkness, and of the length of the way. I replied to all by the absolute necessity there was for my being at Montargis that very night. And thanking him for his brief hospitality, I set off again in a haste which might well have confirmed the truth of my words to him. However, the freshness of the night and the exercise of walking did not fail to change the directions of my thoughts. When away from the objects which had awakened such lively disgust in me, I felt it gradually diminishing. I began to smile at the susceptibility of my feelings, and then, in proportion as the rain became heavier and colder, these strictures on myself assumed a tone of ill temper. I silently accused myself of the absurdity of mistaking sensation for admonitions of my reason. After all, 
Were not the farmer and his sons free to live alone, to hunt, to keep dogs, and to kill a pig? Where was the crime of it, with less nervous susceptibility? I should have accepted the shelter they offered me, and I should now be sleeping snugly on a truss of straw. Instead of walking with difficulty through the cold and drizzling rain, I thus continued to reproach myself, until, toward morning, I arrived at Montardis, jaded and benumbed with cold. When, however, I got up refreshed, toward the middle of the next day, I instinctively returned to my first opinion. The appearance of the farmhouse presented itself to me under the same repulsive colors, which the evening before had determined me to make my escape from it. Reason itself remained silent when reviewing all those coarse details, and was forced to recognize in them the indications of a low nature, or else the presence of some baleful influence. I went away the next day without being able to learn anything concerning the farmer or his sons. But the recollection of my adventure remained deeply fixed in my memory. Ten years afterward, I was traveling in the diligence through the department of the Wart. I was leaning from the window and looking at some coppice ground now for the first time brought under cultivation. And the mode of clearing which one of my traveling companions was explaining to me when my eyes fell upon a walled enclosure with an iron barred gate. Inside it I perceived a house with all the blinds closed, and which I immediately recollected. It was the farmhouse where I had been sheltered. I eagerly pointed it out to my companion and asked who lived in it. Nobody just now, replied he. But was it not kept, some years ago, by a farmer and his two sons? The Turos, said my traveling companion, looking at me, should it you know them? I saw them once. He shook his head, yes, yes, resumed he, for many years, they lived there like wolves in their den. They merely knew how to till land, kill game, and drink. The father managed the house, but men living alone, without women to love them, without children to soften them, and without God to make them think of heaven, always turn into wild beasts, you see. So one morning the eldest son, who had been drinking too much brandy, would not harness the plough horses. His father struck him with his whip, and the son, who was mad drunk, shot him dead with his gun. 16th p.m. I have been thinking of the story of the old cashier these two days. It came so opportunely upon the reflections my dream had suggested to me. Have I not an important lesson to learn from all this? If our sensations have an incontestable influence upon our judgments, how comes it that we are so little careful of those things which awaken or modify these sensations? The external world is always reflected in us as in a mirror and fills our minds with pictures which, unconsciously to ourselves, become the germs of our opinions and of our rules of conduct. All the objects which surround us are then, in reality, so many talismans whence good and evil influences are emitted. And it is for us to choose them wisely, so as to create a healthy atmosphere for our minds. Feeling convinced of this truth, I set about making a survey of my attic. The first object on which my eyes rest is an old map of the history of the principal monastery in my native province. 
I had unrolled it with much satisfaction, and placed it on the most conspicuous part of the wall. Why had I given it this place, ought this sheet of old worm-eaten parchment to be of so much value to me? Who am neither an antiquary nor a scholar, is not its real importance in my sight that one of the abbots who founded it bore my name, and that I shall, perchance, be able to make myself a genealogical tree of it for the edification of my visitors. While writing this, I feel my own blushes. Come down with the map, let us banish it into my deepest drawer. As I passed my glass, I perceived several visiting cards complacently displayed in the frame. By what chance is it that there are only names that make a show among them? Here is a Polish count, a retired colonel, the deputy of my department. Quick, quick, into the fire with these proofs of vanity, and let us put this card in the handwriting of our office boy. This direction for cheap dinners, and the receipt of the broker where I bought my last armchair, in their place. These indications of my poverty will serve, as Mantani says, mater ma super be, and will always make me recollect the modesty in which the dignity of the lowly consists. I have stopped before the prince hanging upon the wall. This large and smiling Pomona, seated on sheaves of corn, and whose basket is overflowing with fruit, only produces thoughts of joy and plenty. I was looking at her the other day, when I fell asleep denying such a thing as misery. Let us give her as companion this picture of winter, in which everything tells of sorrow and suffering. One picture will modify the other. And this happy family of Giuses, what joy in the children's eyes, what sweet repose in the young woman's face, what religious feeling in the grandfather's countenance, may God preserve their happiness to them, but let us hang by its side the picture of this mother, who weeps over an empty cradle. Human life has two faces, both of which we must dare to contemplate in their turn, let me hide, too, these ridiculous monsters which ornament my chimney-piece. Plato has said that the beautiful is nothing else than the visible form of the good. If it is so, the ugly should be the visible form of the evil, and, by constantly beholding it, the mind insensibly deteriorates. But above all, in order to cherish the feelings of kindness and pity, let me hang at the foot of my bed this affecting picture of the last sleep. Never have I been able to look at it without feeling my heart touched. An old woman, clothed in rags, is lying by a roadside, her stick is at her feet, and her head rests upon a stone. She has fallen asleep. Her hands are clasped, murmuring a prayer of her childhood. She sleeps her last sleep. She dreams her last dream. She sees herself, again a strong and happy child, keeping the sheep on the common. Gathering the berries from the hedges, singing, curtsying to passers-by, and making the sign of the cross, when the first star appears in the heavens, happy time. Filled with fragrance and sunshine, she wants nothing yet, for she is ignorant of what there is to wish for. But see her grown up, the time is come for working bravely, she must cut the corn, thresh the wheat, carry the bundles of flowering clover or branches of withered leaves to the farm. If her toil is hard, Hope shines like a sun over everything, and it wipes the drops of sweat away. The growing girl already sees that life is a task, 
but she still sings as she fulfills it. By and by the burden becomes heavier. She is a wife. She is a mother. She must economize the bread of today. Have her eye upon the morrow. Take care of the sick and sustain the feeble. She must act, in short, that part of an earthly providence. So easy when God gives us his aid, so hard when he forsakes us. She is still strong, but she is anxious. She sings no longer. Yet a few years, and all is overcast. The husband's health is broken. His wife sees him pine away by the now fireless hearth. Cold and hunger finish what sickness had begun. He dies and his widow sits on the ground by the coffin provided by the charity of others. Pressing her two half-naked little ones in her arms. She dreads the future. She weeps and she droops her head. At last, the future has come. The children are grown up, but they are no longer with her. Her son is fighting under his country's flag, and his sister is gone. Both have been lost to her for a long time, perhaps forever, and the strong girl, the brave wife, the courageous mother, is henceforth only a poor old beggar woman, without a family and without a home. She weeps no more, sorrow has subdued her. She surrenders and waits for death, death, that faithful friend of the wretched is come, not hideous and with mockery. As superstition represents, but beautiful, smiling, and crowned with stars, the gentle phantom stoops to the beggar. Its pale lips murmur a few airy words, which announce to her the end of her labors. A peaceful joy comes over the aged beggar woman, and leaning on the shoulder of the great deliverer, she has passed unconsciously from her last earthly sleep to her eternal rest. Lie there, thou poor way-wearied woman, the leaves will serve thee for a winding sheet. Night will shed her tears of dew over thee, and the birds will sing sweetly by thy remains. Thy visit here below will not have left more trace than their flight through the air. Thy name is already forgotten, and the only legacy thou haste to leave is the hawthorn stick lying forgotten at thy feet. Well, some one will take it up some soldier of that great human host which is scattered abroad by misery or by vice. For thou art not an exception, thou art an instance, and under the same sun which shines so pleasantly upon all. In the midst of these flowering vineyards, this ripe corn, and these wealthy cities, entire generations suffer. Succeed each other, and still bequeath to each the beggar's stick. The sight of this sad picture shall make me more grateful for what God has given me, and more compassionate for those whom he has treated with less indulgence. It shall be a lesson and a subject for reflection for me. Ah, if we would watch for everything that might improve and instruct us, if the arrangements of our daily life were so disposed as to be a constant school for our minds, but oftenest we take no heed of them. Man is an eternal mystery to himself. His own person is a house into which he never enters, and of which he studies the outside alone. Each of us need have continually before him the famous inscription which once instructed Socrates, and which was engraved on the walls of Delphi by an unknown hand. Know Thyself, Chapter Roman 12, The End of the Year, December 30th, P. M. I was in bed, 
and hardly recovered from the delirious fever which had kept me for so long between life and death. My weakened brain was making efforts to recover its activity, my thoughts like rays of light struggling through the clouds. Were still confused and imperfect, at times I felt a return of the dizziness which made a chaos of all my ideas, and I floated, so to speak, between alternate fits of mental wandering and consciousness. Sometimes everything seemed plain to me, like the prospect which, from the top of some high mountain, opens before us in clear weather. We distinguish water, woods, villages, cattle, even the cottage perched on the edge of the ravine. Then suddenly there comes a gust of wind laden with mist, and all is confused and indistinct. Thus, yielding to the oscillations of a half-recovered reason, I allowed my mind to follow its various impulses without troubling myself to separate the real from the imaginary. I glided softly from one to the other, and my dreams and waking thoughts succeeded closely upon one another. Now, while my mind is wandering in this unsettled state, see, underneath the clock which measures the hours with its loud ticking, a female figure appears before me. At first sight I saw enough to satisfy me that she was not a daughter of Eve, in her eye was the last flash of an expiring star, and her face had the pallor of an heroic death struggle. She was dressed in a drapery of a thousand changing colors of the brightest and the most somber hues, and held a withered garland in her hand. After having contemplated her for some moments, I asked her name, and what brought her into my attic. Her eyes, which were following the movements of the clock, turned toward me, and she replied, You see in me the year which is just drawing to its end. I come to receive your thanks and your farewell. I raised myself on my elbow in surprise, which soon gave place to bitter resentment. Ah, you want thanks, cried I. But first let me know what for. And I welcomed your coming. I was still young and vigorous. You have taken from me each day some little of my strength. And you have ended by inflicting an illness upon me. Already, thanks to you, my blood is less warm, my muscles less firm, and my feet less agile than before. You have planted the germs of infirmity in my bosom. There, where the summer flowers of life were growing, you have wickedly sown the nettles of old age. And, as if it were not enough to weaken my body, you have also diminished the powers of my soul. You have extinguished her enthusiasm. She is become more sluggish and more timid. Formerly her eyes took in the whole of mankind in their generous survey, but you have made her nearsighted. And now she hardly sees beyond herself. That is what you have done for my spiritual being, then as to my outward existence. See to what grief, neglect, and misery you have reduced it, for the many days that the fever has kept me chained to this bed. Who has taken care of this home in which I placed all my joy? Shall I not find my closets empty? My bookcase.
stripped, all my poor treasures lost through negligence or dishonesty. Where are the plants I cultivated? The birds I fed, all are gone, my attic is despoiled, silent and solitary, as it is only for the last few moments that I have returned to a consciousness of what surrounds me. I am even ignorant who has nursed me during my long illness, doubtless some hireling, who will leave when all my means of recompense are exhausted, and what will my masters, for whom I am bound to work, have said to my absence, at this time of the year, when business is most pressing? Can they have done without me? Will they even have tried to do so? Perhaps I am already superseded in the humble situation by which I earned my daily bread, and it is thou thou alone. Wicked daughter of time, who haste brought all these misfortunes upon me, strength, health, comfort, work thou haste taken all from me. I have only received outrage and loss from thee, and yet thou darest to claim my gratitude, Ah, die then, since thy day is come, but die despised and cursed, and may I write on thy tomb the epitaph the Arabian poet inscribed upon that of a king. Rejoice, thou passer-by, he whom we have buried here cannot live again. I was wakened by a hand taking mine, and opening my eyes, I recognized the doctor. After having felt my pulse, he nodded his head, sat down at the foot of the bed, and looked at me, rubbing his nose with his snuff-box. I have since learned that this was a sign of satisfaction with the doctor. Well, so we wanted old snub-nose to carry us off, said M. Lambert, in his half-joking, half-scolding way. What the deuce of a hurry we were in! It was necessary to hold you back with both arms at least. Then you had given me up? Doctor, asked I, rather alarmed. Not at all, replied the old physician. We can't give up what we have not got, and I make it a rule never to have any hope. We are but instruments in the hands of Providence, and each of us should say, with Ambroise Pear, I tend him. God cures him. May he be blessed then, as well as you, cried I, and may my health come back with the new year. M. Lambert shrugged his shoulders. Begin by asking yourself for it, resumed he bluntly. God has given it you, and it is your own sense, and not chance, that must keep it for you. One would think, to hear people talk, that sickness comes upon us like the rain or the sunshine, without one having a word to say in the matter. Before we complain of being ill, we should prove that we deserve to be well. I was about to smile. But the doctor looked angry. Ah, you think that I am joking, resumed he, raising his voice. But tell me, then, which of us gives his health the same attention that he gives to his business? Do you economize your strength as you economize your money? Do you avoid excess and imprudence, in the one case with the same care as extravagance or foolish speculations in the other? Do you keep as regular accounts of your mode of living as you do of your income? Do you consider every evening what has been wholesome or unwholesome for you? The same care that you bring to the examination of your expenditure, you may smile. But have you not brought this illness on yourself by a thousand indiscretions? I began to protest against this, and asked him to point out these indiscretions. The old doctor spread out his fingers, 
and began to reckon upon them one by one. Primo cried he want of exercise. You live here like a mouse in a cheese, without air, motion, or change. Consequently, the blood circulates badly, the fluids thicken, the muscles, being inactive, do not claim their share of nutrition. The stomach flags, and the brain grows weary. Secondo, irregular food. Caprice is your cook, your stomach a slave who must accept what you give it, but who presently takes a sullen revenge. Like all slaves, Tertio, sitting up late, instead of using the night for sleep, you spend it in reading. Your bedstead is a bookcase, your pillow's a desk. At the time when the wearied brain asks for rest, you lead it through these nocturnal orgies. And you are surprised to find it the worse for them the next day. Quarto luxurious habits shut up in your attic you insensibly surround yourself with a thousand effeminate indulgences you must have list for your door a blind for your window a carpet for your feet an easy chair stuffed with wool for your back your fire lit at the first sign of cold and a shade to your lamp and thanks to all these precautions. The least draft makes you catch cold, common chairs give you no rest, and you must wear spectacles to support the light of day. You have thought you were acquiring comforts, and you have only contracted infirmities. Quinto, ah, enough, enough, doctor, cried I, pray, do not carry your examination farther. Do not attach a sense of remorse to each of my pleasures. The old doctor rubbed his nose with his snuff-box. You see, said he, more gently, and rising at the same time. You would escape from the truth. You shrink from inquiry a proof that you are guilty. A misconfitantum reum, but at least, my friend, do not go on laying the blame on time, like an old woman. Thereupon he again felt my pulse and took his leave, declaring that his function was at an end, and that the rest depended upon myself. When the doctor was gone, I set about reflecting upon what he had said, Although his words were too sweeping, they were not the less true in the main. How often we accuse chance of an illness, the origin of which we should seek in ourselves, perhaps it would have been wiser to let him finish the examination he had begun. But is there not another of more importance that which concerns the health of the soul? Am I so sure of having neglected no means of preserving that during the year which is now ending, have I? As one of God's soldiers upon earth kept my courage and my arms efficient, shall I be ready for the great review of souls which must pass before him who is in the dark valley of Jehoshaphat? Darest thou examine thyself, O my soul? and see how often thou hast erred. First, thou hast erred through pride, for I have not duly valued the lowly. I have drunk too deeply of the intoxicating wines of genius, and have found no relish in pure water. I have disdained those words which had no other beauty than their sincerity. I have ceased to love men solely because they are men I have loved them for their endowments. I have contracted the world within the narrow compass of a pantheon, and my sympathy has been awakened by admiration only. The vulgar crowd, which I ought to have followed with a friendly eye because it is composed of my brothers in hope or grief, 
I have let pass by with as much indifference as if it were a flock of sheep. I am indignant with him who rolls in riches and despises the man poor in worldly wealth. And yet, vain of my trifling knowledge, I despise him who is poor in mind, I scorn the poverty of intellect as others do that of dress. I take credit for a gift which I did not bestow on myself, and turn the favor of fortune into a weapon with which to attack others. Ah, if, in the worst days of revolutions, ignorance has revolted and raised a cry of hatred against genius. The fault is not alone in the envious malice of ignorance, but comes in part, too, from the contemptuous pride of knowledge. Alas, I have too completely forgotten the fable of the two sons of the magician of Baghdad. One of them, struck by an irrevocable decree of destiny, was born blind, while the other enjoyed all the delights of sight. The latter, proud of his own advantages, laughed at his brother's blindness, and disdained him as a companion. One morning the blind boy wished to go out with him. To what purpose, said he, since the gods have put nothing in common between us, for me creation is a stage. Where a thousand charming scenes and wonderful actors appear in succession, for you it is only an obscure abyss. At the bottom of which you hear the confused murmur of an invisible world. Continue then alone in your darkness, and leave the pleasures of light to those upon whom the day star shines. With these words he went away, and his brother, left alone, began to cry bitterly. His father, who heard him, immediately ran to him, and tried to console him by promising to give him whatever he desired. Can you give me sight? asked the child. Fate does not permit it, said the magician. Then, cried the blind boy eagerly, I ask you to put out the sun. Who knows whether my pride has not provoked the same wish on the part of some one of my brothers who does not see. But how much oftener have I erred through levity and want of thought? We laugh at the honor of one, and compromise the reputation of another, like an idle man who saunters along a hedgerow, breaking the young branches, and destroying the most beautiful flowers. And, nevertheless, it is by this very thoughtlessness that the fame of some men is created. It rises gradually, like one of those mysterious mounds in barbarous countries, to which a stone is added by every passer-by. Each one brings something at random, and adds it as he passes, without being able himself to see whether he is raising a pedestal or a gibbet. Who will dare look behind him, to see his rash judgments held up there to view? Some time ago I was walking along the edge of the green mound on which the Montmartre Telegraph stands. Below me, along one of the zigzag paths which wind up the hill, a man and a girl were coming up and arrested my attention. The man wore a shaggy coat, which gave him some resemblance to a wild beast, and he held a thick stick in his hand with which he described various strange figures in the air. He spoke very loud, and in a voice which seemed to me convulsed with passion. He raised his eyes every now and then with an expression of savage harshness, and it appeared to me that he was reproaching and threatening the girl, and that she was listening to him with a submissiveness which touched my heart, 
Two or three times she ventured a few words, doubtless in the attempt to justify herself. But the man in the greatcoat began again immediately with his loud and angry voice, his savage looks, and his threatening evolutions in the air. I followed him with my eyes, vainly endeavoring to catch a word as he passed, until he disappeared behind the hill. I had evidently just seen one of those domestic tyrants whose sullen tempers are excited by the patience of their victims. I cursed the unknown savage in my heart, and I felt indignant that these crimes against the sacred peace of home could not be punished as they deserve. When I heard his voice approaching nearer, he had turned the path and soon appeared before me at the top of the slope. The first glance and his first words explained everything to me in place of what I had taken for the furious tones and terrible looks of an angry man. And the attitude of a frightened victim, I had before me only an honest citizen who squinted and stuttered, but who was explaining the management of silkworms to his attentive daughter. I turned homeward, smiling at my mistake, but before I reached my Faubourg I saw a crowd running, I heard calls for help, and every finger pointed in the same direction to a distant column of flame. A manufactory had taken fire, and everybody was rushing forward to assist in extinguishing it. I hesitated. Night was coming on, and I felt tired. A favorite book was awaiting me. I thought there would be no want of help. And I went on my way, just before I had erred from want of consideration. Now it was from selfishness and cowardice. But what have I not on a thousand other occasions forgotten the duties which bind us to our fellow men? Is this the first time I have avoided paying society what I owe it? Have I not always behaved to my companions with injustice? And like the lion, have I not claimed successively every share? If any one is so ill-advised as to ask me to return some little portion, I get provoked, I am angry, I try to escape from it by every means. How many times, when I have perceived a beggar sitting huddled up at the end of the street, have I not gone out of my way? For fear that compassion would impoverish me by forcing me to be charitable, how often have I doubted the misfortunes of others? that I might with justice harden my heart against them? With what satisfaction have I sometimes verified the vices of the poor man in order to show that his misery is the punishment he deserves? Oh, let us not go farther, let us not go farther. I interrupted the doctor's examination. But how much sadder is this one? We pity the diseases of the body. We shudder at those of the soul. I was happily disturbed in my reverie by my neighbor, the old soldier. Now I think of it, I seem always to have seen, during my fever, the figure of this good old man, sometimes leaning against my bed, and sometimes sitting at his table, surrounded by his sheets of pasteboard, he has just come in with his glue pot, his choir of green paper, and his great scissors. I called him by his name. He uttered a joyful exclamation and came near me. Well, so the bullet is found again, cried he, taking my two hands into the maimed one which was left him. It has not been without trouble. I can tell you the campaign has been long enough to win two clasps in. 
I have seen no few fellows with the fever batter windmills during my hospital days at Leipzig. I had a neighbor who fancied a chimney was on fire in his stomach, and who was always calling for the fire engines, but the third day it all went out of itself. But with you it has lasted twenty-eight days as long as one of the little corporal's campaigns. I am not mistaken then, you were near me. Well, I had only to cross the passage. This left hand has not made you a bad nurse for want of the right. But, bah, you did not know what hand gave you drink. And it did not prevent that beggar of a fever from being drowned for all the world like Poniatowski in the Elster. The old soldier began to laugh, and I, feeling too much affected to speak, pressed his hand against my breast. He saw my emotion, and hastened to put an end to it. By the by, you know that from today you have a right to draw your rations again, resumed he gaily. Four meals, like the German mainers, nothing more. The doctor is your house steward. We must find the cook, too, replied I with a smile. She is found, said the veteran. Who is she? Genevieve. The fruit woman. While I am talking, she is cooking for you, neighbor, and do not fear her sparing either butter or trouble. As long as life and death were fighting for you, the honest woman passed her time in going up and down stairs to learn which way the battle went. And stay, I am sure this is she. In fact, we heard steps in the passage. And he went to open the door. Oh, well, continued he, it is Mother Milot, our portress, another of your good friend's neighbor, and whose poultices I recommend to you. Come in, Mother Milot, come in. We are quite bonny boys this morning, and ready to step a minuet if we had our dancing shoes. The portress came in quite delighted. She brought my linen, washed and mended by herself, with a little bottle of Spanish wine. The gift of her sailor son, and kept for great occasions. I would have thanked her, but the good woman imposed silence upon me, under the pretext that the doctor had forbidden me to speak. I saw her arrange everything in my drawers, the neat appearance of which struck me. An attentive hand had evidently been there, and day by day put straight the unavoidable disorder consequent on sickness. As she finished, Genevieve arrived with my dinner. She was followed by Mother Denny's, the milk woman over the way. Who had learned at the same time the danger I had been in, and that I was now beginning to be convalescent. The good Savoyard brought me a new laid egg, which she herself wished to see me eat. It was necessary to relate minutely all my illness to her. At every detail, she uttered loud exclamations. Then, when the portress warned her to be less noisy, she excused herself in a whisper. They made a circle around me to see me eat my dinner. Each mouthful I took was accompanied by their expressions of satisfaction and thankfulness. Never had the King of France, when he dined in public, excited such admiration among the spectators. As they were taking the dinner away, my colleague, the old cashier, entered in his turn. I could not prevent my heart beating as I recognized him. How would the heads of the firm look upon my absence, and what did he come to tell me? 
I waited with inexpressible anxiety for him to speak, but he sat down by me, took my hand, and began rejoicing over my recovery. Without saying a word about our masters, I could not endure this uncertainty any longer. And the messieurs Dermer, asked I hesitatingly, how have they taken the interruption to my work? There has been no interruption, replied the old clerk quietly. What do you mean? Each one in the office took a share of your duty, all has gone on as usual, and the Messieurs Dermer have perceived no difference. This was too much. After so many instances of affection, this filled up the measure. I could not restrain my tears. Thus the few services I had been able to do for others had been acknowledged by them a hundredfold. I had sown a little seed and every grain had fallen on good ground, and brought forth a whole sheaf. Ah, this completes the lesson the doctor gave me, if it is true that the diseases, whether of the mind or body, are the fruit of our follies and our vices. Sympathy and affection are also the rewards of our having done our duty. Every one of us, with God's help, character, and permanent condition. Everybody is gone. The old soldier has brought me back my flowers and my birds. They are my only companions. The setting sun reddens my half-closed curtains with its last rays. My brain is clear, and my heart lighter. A thin mist floats before my eyes, and I feel myself in that happy state which precedes a refreshing sleep. Yonder, opposite the bed, the pale goddess in her drapery of a thousand changing colors, and with her withered garland, again appears before me, but this time I hold out my hand to her with a grateful smile. Adieu, beloved year, whom I but now unjustly accused. That which I have suffered must not be laid to thee, for thou wast but a tract through which God had marked out my road a ground, where I had reaped the harvest I had sown. I will love thee, thou wayside shelter, for those hours of happiness thou hast seen me enjoy. I will love thee even for the suffering thou hast seen me endure. Neither happiness nor suffering came from thee, but thou hast been the scene for them. Descend again then in peace into eternity and be blessed, thou who hast left me experience in the place of youth. Sweet memories instead of past time, and gratitude as payment for good offices. Etext Editor's Bookmarks Ambrose Pear I tend him, God cures him. Are we then bound to others only by the enforcement of laws, attach a sense of remorse to each of my pleasures, but above these ruins rises a calm and happy face, contemptuous pride of knowledge, death. That faithful friend of the wretched houses are vessels which take mere passengers, I make it a rule never to have any hope ignorant of what there is to wish for looks on an accomplished duty neither as a merit nor a grievance more stir than work nothing is dishonorable which is useful richer than France herself. For I have no deficit in my budget satisfy our wants, if we know how to set bounds to them sensible man who has observed much and speaks little sullen tempers, are excited by the patience of their victims the happiness of the wise man costs but little we do not understand, that others may live on their own account what have you done with the days God granted you you may know the game by the lair. Thanks for watching this video book is provided by Streambooks.